please join me in our call to worship. What shall we return to the Lord for all the good things God has done for us? We will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are those who find their refuge in God. Come, let us worship God together. pray with me. O oh God of grace, you have given us minds to know you, hearts to love you, and voices to sing your praise. Fill us with your spirit that we might celebrate your glory and worship you in spirit and truth this day and always through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now let us confess our sins before God first silently and then we'll join together in our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Hi guys. Today I have brought with me Frank's glasses. You know, when he was a kid, he couldn't really see very well. When he wanted to watch TV, he had to sit really close to the screen. Or if he wanted to read a book, he had to hold it up really close to his face. And when he went to school, he had to sit in the front row just to be able to see what the teacher was writing on the board. But when he got these glasses, everything's changed. His eyes were open and he could see clearly. And Jesus does the same thing for us. Sometimes we have metaphorical blinders on or we don't understand what's going on around us and we're blinded by fear. But Jesus will open our eyes to the truth of God's love and he'll remind us that he walks with us and will help us through any situation. So whenever there's a time in your life where you don't understand things or can't see them clearly, Pray to Jesus, ask him to open your eyes and he will because he loves you 
and wants the best for you. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for opening my eyes. Help me to rely on you so I can see things clearly. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. The story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them said, whose name was Cleopas, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place here in these days? He asked them, what things? And they replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, in word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of the group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly saying, stay with us because it's almost evening and the day's now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Our road to faith can be long and circuitous. We can grow up going to Sunday school and to youth group, and we can sing the hymns, we can pray the prayers, we can go to worship every Sunday but none of that guarantees our faith because we don't have to believe what it is that we see and hear. And if we're honest about it, there are times that all of us have when our doubts just simply overwhelm us and it's hard to see where Jesus is in our midst. The two disciples had been in Jerusalem for the Passover and they knew that Jesus had been crucified. They'd heard rumors that he had risen but they hadn't seen him for themselves. And so they didn't expect to see him either. They pack up, they go home, they're unsettled, they're upset, their lives are upended. And they head towards Emmaus, a place that's indicated only in Luke's gospel, and its location has actually intrigued scholars for years. Because where was it? What did it look like? How big was it? 
How far was it really from Jerusalem and in which direction? Nobody knows for sure. Maybe that's why John Buchanan suggests that Emmaus is that place where we go. When our sense of loss weighs us down and while we walk to Emmaus, we then remember through our losses, walking and talking about what we did have, but no longer have, or what we hoped for, but it never materialized. And it's in the middle of this vulnerable conversation between these two close disciples that Jesus shows up, but they don't recognize him even though they knew him well. So well, in fact, that in some faith traditions, they believe that Cleopas was actually Joseph's brother, which would make him Jesus' uncle. And his wife, named Mary, was at the foot of the cross with Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus. And that means the two travelers were probably, or could have been, husband and wife, who were traveling from Jerusalem back towards home. But all this mystery is unusual for Luke. If you think about Luke as a gospel writer, he's the one who gives us all the detail. He's a physician by profession. And so you think of the Christmas story and how much is in the gospel of Luke that doesn't appear in the other gospels. Or the story of the Good Samaritan or the prodigal son and how long they are and how much detail is provided for us there. So why here in this story suddenly are the facts sketchy? Well, it could be because Luke wants us to know that not all of life is wrapped up in one neat package. Not all of life is predictable. And so we're invited to join these unknown disciples on their walk to this unknown town, knowing that Emmaus can be any place where we too walk when life isn't unfolding in the way we hoped it would. What do they do? They talk. They talk about the loss of their friend and of the future that didn't materialize how they hoped that it would. They talk about the hopes and dreams that they had that disappeared in an instant. And just as when we face loss ourselves, they internalize it, it consumes them, it takes over their mind and their heart. And as Fred Craddock once said, the longest journey any of us will ever take is that journey from our head to our heart. It takes the disciples a full seven miles to get there. How long had Jesus been walking beside them on the road before he started talking? Was it one mile or five miles? We don't know. All we know is he starts talking and they don't recognize his voice or anything about him. What are you discussing, he asks. And they look at him dumbfounded. Really? Don't you know? Are you the only one in all of Jerusalem who doesn't know what's happened these last three days? How Jesus of Nazareth was crucified and died? How could you have missed it? And of course, he didn't miss it because he's the risen Christ. They just don't know it yet that he's their savior and ours. But Cleopas and his companion remember a crucified Jesus, a Jesus who didn't fulfill the expectations that they had that he would become this king of Israel and take over Rome. They don't recognize the living Jesus, the living God who transforms what is to what can be a future filled with hope. And so he helps them make that transition. He reminds them of the Old Testament prophecies that predicted his coming and how he fulfills those scriptures. He does everything he can think of short of showing him exactly who he is. But not even that works. Oh, it piques their interest for sure. They want to learn more from him. They recognize that this is a knowledgeable man who really knows the scriptures inside and out. They want to get to know him better. There's something about him that intrigues them, but they still don't know who it is who walks with them because their journey from their head to their heart isn't yet complete. And we've all been there, I think. 
convinced that what we think we know to be the truth is more certain than what we actually see or hear. But they like this stranger, this companion on the journey, so they invite him to stay with them, to abide with them, and he does. And that's when Jesus makes his move. He takes bread, he blesses it, he breaks it, and suddenly their eyes are opened and they recognize him fully as their Savior and Lord. It's interesting what it takes them to see. Not even a crash course by Jesus himself enables these disoriented disciples to recognize him, which means it always takes more than just a commitment to start the journey, more than reading the scriptures, more than coming together in fellowship or worship. It takes two or more gathered in the presence of God, breaking bread together for the fullness of God to be revealed. Of course, the same holds true for us. For as Eugene Peterson puts it, we are part of something larger than ourselves that we can't adequately be part of by ourselves. In his book, Sources of Strength, Jimmy Carter reflects on the story of these two disciples on their way to Emmaus. And he writes, there are times that each of us fails to recognize the presence of Christ, even though he's in our midst. The scriptures promise us that Christ is with us and not just in an occasional miraculous event, but all the time. After all, he tells us, here I am, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, then I will come to them. I'll come in, I'll eat with them, and they with me. So an experience like that of the disciples who recognize Jesus in the breaking of bread is always available to us. But it's easy even for dedicated Christians, Carter says, to put off opening the door to Jesus. Today seems never to be the right day to do it. Just wait, we say, until the kids are grown and they're out of college or we make our last house payment or we're retired. Then we'll try to put our lives uh, in focus and put into our lives the kind of things we would want to do if Christ were here with us. But Christ is here. And when we open our hearts to others, we open the door to him. And that's when we realize that Christ is with us now. The disciples open their hearts to this stranger. They invite him to abide with them. And this word abide means so much more than coming into the house and having dinner with them. Because when somebody abides with us, they take up residence, not just in our home, but in our heart and soul. And Jesus feeds their souls so that the journey between the head and the heart is complete. They finally see Jesus at the table with them. They can't wait to tell others that he had risen. He vanishes from sight and they head back to Jerusalem immediately in order to go and witness to what they had seen so others would know too. I think we've all been given a gift on this side of the resurrection. I think we've been given the gift of a loving community of faith who walks with us on our roads to Emmaus. And through worship and children's programming and the mom's group and Bible study and collecting food for the needy and our individual relationships with one another and the ways we reach out to each other, we know what it means to abide with one another. But sometimes we need to be reminded, just as the disciples did, that Jesus is right with us in the midst of everything we do and say. And the only way that we can be reminded is to make that connection between our head and our heart, because it takes looking beyond our own range of vision to look out to see others and to be able to love others as ourselves. I read a story of a mail carrier who did just that. 
He had a PhD in English literature and had been a professor at Eastern University right here in St. David's. But he felt the calling of God on his life to stop what he was doing and instead to become a mail carrier. Well, you can imagine the other people in his department were all trying to convince him not to do that, not to give up this wonderful career he had in order to be a mail carrier. Why would you want to do that, they asked. But he insisted, he was sure that God was pointing him in this direction. And so he was given a route and he started collecting mail. And after a year or so, he went back to Eastern University to see his old colleagues and they wanted to know how he was doing. He said, oh, I love what I'm doing, it's, it's great. Well, one of his colleagues was Tony Campolo, who many of you may have heard about. And Tony said to him, you know, you really belong here. We really need you back here at Eastern University. But he said, no, I'm sure this is where I need to be. And Tony said, well, then, Charlie, if you're going to be a mail carrier, be the best mail carrier you can be. And Charlie said, well, you know, I'm really not a very good mail carrier. Tony said, you're not. Why aren't you? And he said, well, everybody else seems to be able to finish their route by one o'clock in the afternoon. But I never finish mine until about six o'clock at night. You don't. Why not? He said, because I visit everybody. He said, do you know how many people had never been visited before I became their mailman? But now I've got a new problem. I can't sleep at night. And Tony said, well, why can't you sleep? He said, well, could you sleep after having 20 cups of coffee every day as you're visiting with all these people? Well, this was no ordinary mailman. He visited widows, he counseled troubled teenagers, and he told jokes with the men. And on his birthday, the people would get together and those who were in his route and they'd throw him this big birthday bash, ran out a local gym to show them how much they loved him because they could see how much he loved them. Charlie was changing his world, one person at a time, touching them where they were and making a difference in their lives. It made the journey from his head to his heart. And they knew it, just as Jesus knew it, as the two companions shared bread with him. I think of any time in our life, we are on a road to Emmaus where exactly that road is leading, or how long it's going to take us, or what it's going to look like when we get there, we don't know. In fact, there are going to be different people who will be walking this journey with us as we go. And when they do, it will be our choice whether or not to make that journey from our head to our heart and reach out to them in love. But as we do, we can be assured of one thing, that Jesus is walking on that road with us, no matter where it leads or how long it lasts, if we have eyes to see and ears to hear. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now let us affirm what we believe using the words of the affirmation of faith that is in your order of worship. This is the good news. The grave is empty. Christ is risen. Alleluia. This is the good news. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never put it out. Alleluia. This is the good news. Once we were no people, but now we are God's people. Alleluia. Amen.
The invitation to the Lord's Supper is offered to everyone who has been baptized. All that is required is a penitent heart and a willing spirit. Jesus said, I am the bread of life, and whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now hear the words of the institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ, as they have been delivered to us by the Apostle Paul. He writes, I have received of the Lord that which I have also given to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, Jesus took the cup when he had supped. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. So do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth the Lord's death until he comes again. And so as our Lord Jesus in the same night in which he was betrayed, took the elements. So we take these elements, both these elements here, as well as the elements in each of your homes to be set apart from their common use to this holy use and mystery. And as Jesus gave thanks and blessed them, let us now draw near to God in prayer and thanksgiving. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. For you are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, whom you sent to deliver us from the bondage of sin and death. In humility, he came to us and knelt in obedience to love's commands. And in freedom, he has now taken our place in death so that we might have eternal life with him in his kingdom. In the deserts of our wanderings, he sustains us, giving us his body as manna for our weariness. And the cup of suffering he drank has become for us the cup of salvation. In his death, he ransomed us from death's dominion. In his resurrection, he opened the way to eternal life. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this cup from the gifts you've given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. And we humbly ask you, O merciful God, to keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory and we will feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, almighty God, world without end. And now as our Savior taught us to pray, we join to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. So let us join around Christ's table together and enjoy this feast that we have been given. This is the body of Christ, 
broken for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. The bread we break and the cup that we take is in not sharing in the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are. Let us join together in our unison prayer of thanksgiving. Gracious God, we thank you that you have nurtured us at the table of your son, Jesus Christ. You have placed your life into our hands. Now we place our lives into yours. Take us, renew and remake us, and dismiss us in peace. For our eyes have now seen your salvation which you have prepared in the presence of all people. May we be your living presence in this world and in the world to come. Amen. <coughs> and now may the peace of God, which passes all our understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and in God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God, our Creator, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our sustainer, be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. <clears throat>